we've got this one life, right? This finite life. And you know, when it's over, it's over. It's the one thing like we all know that we can't buy back. And when it's gone, it's gone. Start feeling of that dread that starts to come from the pit of your stomach because you don't want to have to go back to work on Monday. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Airbnb Nomads podcast. And on this week's Property Education Masterclass, we're bringing out the big guns. On this episode, we're joined by the incredible Jackie Tomes. Now, Jackie is the CEO and founder of Tomes Homes. She's also known throughout the industry as the property strategist and for good reason. Since 2014, Jackie has done over 17 million pounds worth of property deals. She's also raised in excess of five million pounds worth of private investor finance. She now owns and manages over a hundred properties. She's the author of multiple best-selling books, including a brand new release that we're going to talk about in this episode. But here's the best part. She's built these businesses and runs everything while traveling the world with her partner, Dave. Now, guys, if there's an episode that's going to light a fire inside of you and inspire you to go for more, this is the one. So stick around and listen to the entire episode. Guys, on that note, if this episode inspires you, if you get value from this episode, I would ask you to please follow the show and leave us a review. Now, in that review, if you've got any questions, pop that question in the review and we will read it out on the podcast, give you a shout out and also answer that question. So guys, on that note, here we go. Get settled in. This is an amazing episode. I can't wait to get started. Here we go. Hey, Jackie, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Really great to be here. Great. Really, really, really excited for this episode. Now, Jackie, your story, as we're going to find out, is pretty much a rocket ship, right? The things that you've achieved, the numbers that you're producing, the success stories, the case studies, you know, it's it's a phenomenal story. There's so many different rabbit holes that we could go down and different angles and avenues. Um I want to try and incorporate as much of it into this hour as we possibly can because it's such an inspiring story. And the reason why I wanted to have you on and and give you the platform to tell your story is to inspire others, right? Because what you've achieved is amazing. It just goes to show with determination, grit, commitment, a vision, you can pretty much achieve anything, right? And it's absolutely amazing. So because there's so much to cover with a lot of my guests, I'll go right back to the very early days. I think with you, let's try and keep it a little bit more closer to the present because I want to get into the juicy stuff around with what you're doing today. There's also a really cool travel angle to your life, which is also why I wanted to have you on because I'm a massive advocate for that as well. Spend a lot of time overseas, a lot of time living my best life, right? Which you're a big advocate for. So let's let's start, um, Jackie, right at the kind of start of your property journey. Or actually, I'll tell you what, let's start just before that and tell me a little bit about where you was, what you was doing, what your life looked like before you came across the world of property investment. I was I was a failed actor. That was my background before um, I got into working in market research. So I was working for a really nice company in Covent Garden in central London. And yeah, I was doing qualitative research. So I was hosting like focus groups for brands like the Money Advice Service and Nokia and those kind of guys um, and doing consumer research to find out about people and learning how to take that information and feed that into marketing uh, strategy normally for big for big brands. Um, and yeah, it was just a, it was a lovely company and it was a, but it was still a day job and I was still having to be told what to do by other people, which I have never been that great at doing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think that we're aligned in, in many, many things, Jackie. I bang on relentlessly in my socials about how everybody should at least make the effort to try and get out of this money for time exchange trap, right? Getting up, going to the job, getting the paycheck, rinse and repeat. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I'm saying that you can, you know, get to a point with, with a vision, with a, with some drive, right. And saying, I deserve more. I want more. You can get to a point where you can get this life of freedom, which is where you are right now. And also what's refreshing to hear, and I think it's going to be refreshing for the people listening at home, is that you're not sitting there saying, well, before I started in property, I was an economist, I was a high-flying lawyer, I was this, I was that. It also goes to show that, you know, without, you know, sounding, you know, putting you down or anything, you you weren't, you know, a huge high-flying corporate person 
to where you are today, the contrast is very, very impressive. So that's really, really cool to hear and very inspiring for other people. So tell me how it started, Jackie. What, what, what was the kind of steps that led you down this path to where you are today? How did it all begin? It was on a ski holiday and it was like one of those magical weeks of annual leave that you like look forward to all year long. Went on this wonderful ski holiday, saved up a lot to go on this holiday with my now husband, Dave. Just like stayed in a little apartment in the three valleys in France and had this just insanely brilliant week skiing. And it was just the, the age old problem, really, of those of us who have jobs. You come to the end of the week and you're feeling that start feeling of that dread that starts to come up in the pit of your stomach because you don't want to have to go back to work on Monday. And so then I was, you know, I was just like, how. I always loved the idea of having my own business, but I never had, you know, I was watching like The Apprentice and stuff. I never had these like amazing ideas for how, what that business could be. And I'd seen my mum and my stepdad, they'd done some flips and I'd just seen them in property doing their little thing on the side. And I thought maybe property could be the answer. And that's how it, that's how the seed was planted. And I was like, I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get a second job. I'm going to save all of the money I can. And I hopefully in like maybe like 10 years time, I found a way to get a few properties, have enough income coming in that I will not have to ask for permission to go on holiday. And if I don't want to have to go home at the end of that week, I don't want to have to go home. Yeah. So that's how it started. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And it's something that I've said before, you know, this, this, this job thing, and again, not knocking it, we all need to start, we all need to work, we all need to earn money. But the idea of going into a workplace and having someone else put a value on your time, right? And tell you what your time is worth. You come in, you give me your finite time and I'm going to give you these bits of paper, right? And that's the value that I'm placing on your time. That to me is something that I couldn't personally continue with either in my, you know, previous career. So I completely understand that. Did you, Jackie, um, before you got started, now I understand that you internally, you were saying that I want more. Before you started on this journey, did you sit down and have this big vision and this big why and this really clear idea of where you wanted to get to? No, it was like, I want to go on lots of holidays. How can I? And they have to be expensive holidays, just like I wanted the freedom to go on holiday. And I guess stage one, I was like, if I can have enough money coming in to not have to leave my house, maybe I have to live on baked beans and Tesco value. But if I could get to that, that was like my first... Right. <laughs> the bar was low I was like I've got enough income to just cover my mortgage and and um and my food and be able to go on some really simple holidays that would be enough for me and so yeah it wasn't it was not any more grand than that okay so you weren't overthinking it you weren't spending weeks or months procrastinating trying to create and carve out this perfect idea of what you was trying to achieve you just knew that you needed you needed a change right you needed to shift yeah. And it took time because I had, didn't have the money there and ready to go to, to go and buy a property. But it was that commitment that it was like, for me, getting the money together was the barrier. So it was like, how can I make it so that I need the smallest amount of money possible and that I can save the largest amount of money possible. And so that I was like, second job, cut back all my luxuries, stop doing your hair, stop spending money on clothes, no nails, no going out, like cut all of it and just start saving that money instead. And that, that was it, just like smallest amount required uh, and save as much money as I could. Yeah, that, that's a pretty powerful lesson there um, because a lot of people, like we know, you're going to know people and the people listening and watching this are going to know people who say, I want X, Y, Z, right? But they're not prepared to put in the work, make the cutbacks, make the sacrifices. They're not prepared to eat baked beans on toast for six months while they're <laughs> saving up the money for their first investment. So kudos to you for that. Um, so Jackie, um, so another reason why I like your story is because you're busting the myth around the fact that you need to have hundreds of thousands of pounds in the bank in order to build a property portfolio. So you talked about the sacrifices you made in order to start your journey. So how long did that take? And where did you get the knowledge and the inspiration uh, around how to do that and how did you actually begin the first steps into your property investment journey so at first it was all books I just went on Amazon and just found any book that I could about property investing I did what most of us do and just went online and started signing up to all of these random things online I ended up getting invited to webinars and things from different people and I just started really just soaking it in like that first phase of it I didn't 
I didn't go on any courses or anything to get started. It was just me learning from books and going out and trying to make it happen. And it worked. It was slow, but it worked. So it took me 18 months from that point of deciding to do it to actually making it all happen to complete on the first property. So that was the first part of it. Then off the back of it, I it was through Progressive Property. I ended up on one of Rob Moore's webinars. Yep. And I think I would read his book. Um, and I ended up on a webinar with him. I heard about multiple streams of property income and I went along to, to that event. And that was a real game changing sort of shifting moment to go from me being like, how much money can I save to buy property to, oh, you know, and Rob had a lot of credibility for me when I went to that event because the whole first day, basically, he laid out everything that I had learned over the last 18 months albeit from books and albeit very slowly but I was like yes what these guys are saying is 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 legit I get it um and but then he opened my mind to working with investors and that that, that mindset shift was a big part of the next phase of the process do you have any um just before we get past this phase do you have any like must reads or, or or you know books that you really kind of changed your whole mindset I know there's a few that always get kicked around rich dad poor dad and this and that so. yeah it is rich dad poor dad was definitely in there there was a load of very much more practical ones that were just like how to do it there was one that outlined and I can't remember the name off the top of my head but I can find it we can put it in the show notes like it was just about how to analyze an area and how to choose an area yeah. it wasn't like transform your world but it was just like a clear um process to be able to follow which I, we still use to this day and we've just iterated it um and I think yeah it was I think it was beginner's property secrets that I might have read of, of from Rob Moore in those yeah. early days also I think I did read um property property magic as well uh, yes, just I'm like the real yeah. classic get into get into property books really. I think, I think, Probably I think every uh, really I think every investor's got that library right of yes. crumpled <laughs> priest, you know books that have been sitting there for years um yeah completely get it there's some really good reads out there and it just goes to show you don't need to be hemorrhaging you know tens of thousands of pounds on courses i've actually met a couple of people on these but you know it's not the norm most people will go and do the in-person courses and there is that risk that you can become a coursey junkie as you know and you end up just spending loads of money on training never taking action but there's also some people like you that just you know consume books consume podcasts and then you're like you know you go out there and just start so with that with that in mind jackie did you have like a chosen um strategy that you thought would work for you and get you to your end goals like at the beginning or is it emerged over time yeah well, it was, I, I didn't know there was anything apart from single lets, like when I first started. So it was like chosen by accident. So that was the first deal I ever did was just a one bedroom flat on the outskirts of South East London, bought it for like 108 and a half thousand pounds, did a refurb and then did a refinance. So it was like nothing all that sexy, but that was all that I really thought there was as an option. And that's what getting into the world, like around like people like Progressive opened me up to like, oh my God, there's all these other options of these strategies um, that I wasn't even aware of when I was first getting into property um, and yeah like you're, you're right like that first phase I didn't go on any courses but then I did I did do some courses with Progressive um, off the back of like going to the multiple streams property income event and um, yeah it then it was a good thing and a bad thing like in the sense you're suddenly surrounded by loads of inspiring people doing amazing things in property, but it kind of makes you feel like crap about the really boring stuff that you're doing with your right. single lets, right. um, which kind of then really distracted me in so many different directions. And I went from being kind of accidentally focused because I didn't know there was an alternative to suddenly so distracted, trying to do everything, buying HMOs, rent to rent HMOs, title splits, conversions, developments, sourcing just suddenly went like kid in a sweet shop trying to do all these different um, strategies which i wouldn't call a strategy now like for me those are business models it's like yeah. what is it that your business does but the strategy is the wider plan that fits around it but yeah no at the time i didn't know that and i was just like yeah diversify it's really important to diversify your strategy yeah. so then i was like trying to do everything and then it, it that, that was very painful the out the output of that yeah. that phase the old, the old shiny penny syndrome the magpie you know chasing all the all the stuff that shines it i mean everybody does the same thing right it's a very very common story just taking it back a little bit first um because i'm always aware the people that are listening or watching at home you know we throw around terms and you know it's like well, what does that mean for a lot of people when you bought that first leasehold flat for i think you said one hundred eight thousand. 
which right now is just like you can't even believe that you could have bought a property for 108,000, especially anywhere near London. So it just shows what a great investment property is anyway. What was that process like? Because for a lot of people, that's just a dream, right? Just to buy a property, whether it's a rental or, or even to live in, it's such a far off dream. So what, what was the, what was the steps? What was the, what was the timeline like from, okay, I'm going to do property and then get into the point of signing that first contract and completing on your first deal. So it took me probably six months to start to build up a bit of a pot of savings and then to start to go out and do research. And then I was starting to get into the swing for how much I could save every month. So I could kind of see the path to getting a deposit together. And I started reaching out to mortgage brokers around the summer of 2013 um, to have conversations with people. And I was like, I think I'm going to start to have the money basically towards the end of this, of this year. So I wanted to basically make sure I got the pot of money and completed on a property as quickly as possible. Um, I would have been able to complete quicker, but I was only getting to the point of having a 15% deposit for that first property. And there was only one lender that would lend on a 15% deposit. Um, and uh, we applied for a decision in principle and I actually got declined um, because I was only 24 at the time and they deemed it that I should wait till I am 25 to be able to buy an investment yes. property. Well, that um, so that put me back by a few months. Few yes, it all changed when I turned 25, <laughs> I tell you. Just suddenly I was so wise. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I've never heard of any bank offering a buy to let mortgage with a 15% deposit. Is that is that still around today or? I think it is. I think it disappeared for a bit, but I have heard that it's back even on blocks of flats. I've heard that it's back um, with Kent Reliance. Okay. So that, so that puts, so that puts, you know, property investment even closer in the reach of a lot of people's hands because, you know, and I'm so aware, you know, times are hard. The world's a hard place, right? Cost of living, inflation, interest rate hikes. The, the truth is that most people are really just living week to week, right? paycheck to paycheck they're just trying to keep their heads above water so and that's why I like this story like I said at the beginning because you know you didn't come from a place where you were silver spooned you didn't have loads of money in the bank but you still got there through sacrifice through through having a vision through making the decisions and the choices the tough choices right that over a period of time taking steps back in order to move massively forward in the long term right? Which is what a lot of people just aren't prepared to do. They'd rather sit around and say, well, I can't do it because I don't have this. I don't have that. While at the same time, they've got the Netflix accounts, they're getting their Starbucks three times a week, right? So it's all these little things. And it's really, you know, to highlight that what can be done, little baby steps over a period of time, it all adds up and you can get that first one under your belt. So I think you said that you then refinanced that flat. Is that right? Yeah, I had to wait six months to do that. So I think that was like early. So I completed on that one in July 2014 and refinanced it sometime early 2015. Okay. And that was just through pure capital appreciation and house price rises or did you add value to it? Bit of a blend, really. That was like our like blended approach was the way that I kind of made it work. Like it was bought at a good price, did a refurb and had the benefit of the market appreciation as well. And it was kind of those three factors that came together that made it work. Did get down valued on that first property. I remember that being the most devastating thing. Um, just thinking like, I just totally failed. And I remember just, I was so upset. Um, but hey, that's just like part of the industry. You just got to roll with the punches sometimes. But yeah, you know, it's still, I still got my uplift. I still managed to pull money out. Um, and, and by that point, I was starting to look at working with investors anyway. So it right. became less about, that anyway if you love to travel like me and you understand the power in escaping the money for time exchange trap but you just don't know how to do it then building an airbnb consultancy business could be exactly what you have been looking for right now in the uk there is a completely untapped opportunity through helping struggling airbnb hosts by turning around their underperforming properties and generating you huge commission payments in the process we are going to teach you all of the tools and all of the techniques that we've learned over the last five years through building our very own multiple six-figure Airbnb business, arming you with everything that you need to swoop in and save the day. Minimal startup costs, zero risk, and almost unlimited potential. Sound good? Welcome to the Airbnb Consultant. 
contact us through any of the channels included in the studio notes to get the conversation started. So tell us a little bit about that, Jackie. Tell us about, you know, how you had this shift of mindset from you buy your first flat, small investment, obviously, relative to what you're doing today. You're doing, you know, multi-million pound deals. But did you, from the beginning, have this money mindset that, you know, if I can get the hang of this, if I can start demonstrating some strong case studies, I'm able to go out there and, you know, work with people who are time poor, but they've got money in their account and I can start JVing with them and making, doing big, bigger deals. Was that on your radar at the beginning or was that something that kind of come over time? It was a flicker of an, of an idea in that first year of reading all those books. Um, I probably, Simon mentions it in Property Magic, I imagine. And I do I remember I put forward a proposition for an investment to Dave's, uh, to my brother-in-law um, for how we could invest together. Um, but I, I found it a few years later and I was like, damn, he should have said, he just said no. He should have said yes to this because this was like, I was giving him way too much. I was giving everything away yeah. in the way that I put forward this proposition to him. So the idea was there, but I wasn't not realizing how much value that I was bringing as part of that. I, Cause I was so much in the mindset of money is my limiting factor. So therefore money is the most important thing. So therefore all of this other stuff that I'm doing isn't very valuable. So I was still in that mindset and it took me actually going through that first property. Uh, it took the skill, you know, the skills of Rob Moore standing on the stage doing his convincing thing to make me realize that actually I did have value to, to bring. And um, yeah, so it was really only after getting starting to come come to events and to meet other people and realize what other people were doing and to be convinced on my own personal worth of what you know what we were bringing to the table was actually a lot that that was like a real shift again so the seed started to sprout basically yeah and it's a massive shift isn't it because you know again people think if you're a property investor if you're in property you've got all this money or you had money to begin with but when you understand that when you understand the value of knowledge, right? When you understand the value of education and knowing what steps to implement in order to generate massive returns for investors. And then when you couple that with the fact that obviously just by the nature of their business, generally people with lots of surplus cash that want to dump into property, most of them, unless they're born into a very unique situation, very privileged situation, it means that the consequence of that is that they're extremely time poor because they're running multiple businesses, they're traveling all over the world. And they just want someone that they trust, that they can build a relationship with, build rapport with, that knows what the hell they're doing. Their money's going to be safe. And if you can say to them, look, you give me your money and I'll give you 10%, 12%, whatever on that money, right? It's really a no brainer for them. They can go off, carry on with their life, knowing that their money's safe, knowing that it's growing, knowing they're getting a better return than the bank and everybody wins. So this opens the door to everybody in property, but you've got to believe that you can do it. Yeah. And you've got to be willing to take the steps that to get you there. Because I think you're right, you can have all the knowledge, all the opportunity, but most people won't ever do it because actually you've got to be so consistent in your desire to do it, to be willing to overcome all the challenges, to keep committing even when you're having a bad day to it time and time again, to have the patience and the tenacity. Yeah, and we can all do it, but we, yeah, we stop ourselves from doing it. And that's partly because Oh, there's a whole load of things we go into here, but how we self-sabotage ourselves. Absolutely. But yeah, we can all do it, but just most people won't because of the belief system that we have. It's a very, very deep topic. And you're absolutely right. I'd love to lift the lid off that whole can of worms about why we self-sabotage, why we don't think we're good enough, why we've got low self-esteem, da, 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 all going back to God knows when, you know, what one teacher said 25 years ago, right? But it's true. Um, but do you think, Jackie, that the traits that you're demonstrating today and the way that you're, can, you know, building your businesses and raising millions of pounds of finance and doing all these deals, it obviously anyone who doesn't know you, anyone who doesn't know your journey, anyone who doesn't know your background, they look at you and they say, Jackie Tones is this incredible entrepreneur, straight out the gate, right? She had it all set up. She knew what she wanted. She had this vision. She's, you know, she's built to do this stuff. Would you agree with that? Are you a born ready-made entrepreneur or are these things that can be learned? Yeah, it's all, um, it's all, um, and I think at school, I was the shy kid who didn't achieve stuff. Like it's, you wouldn't have looked at me and gone, oh, that, that she's going to grow up to be an entrepreneur. (laughs) I'm not sure what she's going to grow up to do. Um, 
Yeah, I think for me, it's about deciding what you want and becoming the person who can do that. And I feel like that never ends, right? Like the person that I am now can't achieve the stuff yet that I want to achieve. Like I'm having to become a new version of myself to become, to be able to achieve the next things that I want to go out there and be able to do. So I think it's about saying, what, what do we want? What's most important to us? Like staying who I am now and holding on to my current version of my personality and who I am, all the goals that I set for myself. And I think that's just always that choice. And yeah, I've just continued to choose the thing that I want to go out there and make happen and go, what sort of person achieves that? And how can I become that person? Yeah, and I've got a theory. Um, well, it's not a theory for me, I believe it, uh, because I'm, I'm demonstrating it. You can either sit at home, right, and say, well, I'd love to do this, love to do that, but I don't think I can, not worthy, not, you know, not smart enough, not this, not that, and don't do anything. If you get up every single day and you put yourself out there and you're consistent and you're posting on social media and you're documenting your journey and you're telling everybody what you're doing, even if you're not having huge wins, right? And you're not, nobody expects to be where you are in six months, right? It takes time. Anything takes time. But my point is, and I'm seeing this, right? If you are consistent every single day, no matter how many times you get knocked down, you never waver, you're always there, you're on this, whenever anybody opens up their socials, you are there saying, I am this, I'm a property investor, I do this, I do that, I can help you, da 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 banging the drum, right, every single day. It's almost like the universe rewards you for that, right? And it starts mm. to move and, and change things and open different doors and opportunities come up and people drop in your lap and conversations just happen. But it happens, it's a, it's a byproduct of the fact that you are traveling in that one unwavering direction, right? With this absolute mm -hmm. determination to succeed and get to that end goal on that one thing. And I truly believe there's books about this, right? If you say, I'm going to go there and you're like, freaking, I'm going there and no one's going to get in my way. It's just the way that life's theory work. You have to get there. It's, it's, it's just a, mm -hmm. it's a matter of time, right? Would you, would you buy into that? That, that way of thinking yep yeah I would and you know what? I don't even think it has to be every day I think it's different I feel like women we have this monthly hormonal cycle and we feel like different per people at different points in the month and some points in the month I, I do not want to I don't want to do it and so I don't really do it then I think you probably just do it 50 to 70 percent of the time and that is enough mm. um so I don't think it has to be you know it just has to be enough of the time and consistent consistently and um I think it's yeah, I, I did read a quote. I'm always reading. Every day I'm always reading. I read something. Um, I think it might be in a Gay Hendricks quote, basically saying the people that succeed are just the ones that are just still just keep going. Yeah. And I do think that's true. Like I, I'm still here, still doing the same thing pretty much 10, 10, 11 years later. I'm not the best at it. I just kept going long enough. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, without, without sounding, you know, trying to frame this the right way, the world and the way that the majority of people live, right? Life script, leave school, get the job, get the house, get the debt, get the kids. That's it, right? That's life. Nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that the majority of people, rightly or wrongly, they find a, a kind of baseline, right? That's comfortable and that's it. And, uh, you know, that's fine. But my point is that if you put your head above that and you're like, no, I'm going to go for more, right? And I'm going to move into this kind of one, 2% of people that go out and trying to achieve your dreams. And you start demonstrating that to the world and putting out that, that, that way of thinking to the universe, that shit inspires people, right? So you don't even necessarily have to be setting the world on fire. Just the fact that mm -hmm. you're, you're putting yourself out there and saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Watch me, you know, as I move forward on my journey to success, people are like, damn, you know, look at Jackie, like she's, she's left the job. She's like doing her own thing. All of a sudden the phone starts ringing. People start asking to have a coffee date. Can I get some advice, some tips? I've got some money. What can I do with it? Can you advise me? And this is what I mean. It's like the universe starts to mold and change to kind of fit your, your new life. Right. So it's really, mm -hmm. really cool stuff. God, I could go on about it for forever, but I'll try not to get off too, too off piece. Here. But I think you made a really good point there, though. It's like you're just, um, I think you said, like putting your head above the parapet yeah. or just like lifting your head up a little bit. I think it's the same thing. It's like you don't have to get your whole body up above the parapet. 
like that's scary right like just yeah. to be like fully out there like that but you don't have to it's just a, a little bit yeah. consistently and not even all the time again maybe just half the time feeling a bit out of your comfort zone just a little bit i was having a conversation um with uh, two guys nisha and jazz who run a company called castlewood homes who you know documenting their journey in a very similar fashion uh, yesterday and like it was something that really struck me when we were reflecting on their journey they have just they've never rushed it they've been patient in the process which is exactly what we're doing we're consistently being patient consistently being just a little bit out of your comfort zone and you know they've they've gone from doing like one deal in two years to having five deals on the go at the same time right now and if I'd have said to them three years ago, here's five deals on the go right now, and we've only had experience of doing one at a time before, they would have they would have freaked out, they would have crumbled, it would have been too much. And it's the same thing, like you just have to build up the get out of your comfort zone little bit by little bit and continue to do it. And yeah, then the results just compound. Yeah, amazing. So true. Um, tell us now, Jackie, what happens after you refinance the flat? What 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 happens next? with strategies with investments with finance what's the journey where how did it how did it go after that point so after that first property then i start to believe we've got value to go out and meet investors um and we approach family first of, first of all um, and they become our first investors we use our first deal as a case study uh, and we start going out there and agreeing more of the same deal that we'd already done basically same area same kind of price let's just do the same thing again um and it was it was crazy i remember the time on social media it'd be like oh just agreed another property just agreed another property and in a, like a space of a few months just i can't remember maybe a seven agreed or something in the space of like three or four months wow. it was like rapid because suddenly the belief was there to go out there and raise finance and we started to do that going out there at networking events all the stuff that you're talking about posting on social media and starting to meet other potential um investors as well but all of that next hit of properties the same thing bar one um one bedroom flats outskirts of southeast london some we reconfigured to turn into a two bed but it was all refurbish refinance single let properties and that was like the first tranche so over about the next 12 months another 10 deals completed uh, all bar one were all individual properties individual flats buy to let properties using that exact same process similar spec of refurb and then going on six months later to um, six months or two years later to go and refinance those properties um, and that just it went from it all being about us and our money and to that no longer being the limiting factor so that was like the success of that next phase was like suddenly we just replicated loads what we'd done once and uh, that's when my husband Dave came on board properly as well. He went from being a support to like side by side with me. But also during that time was when I that shiny penny monster started to kind of creep in. And that distraction was starting to layer itself on top of the good stuff that was going on with these really simple purchases. All of the distraction was feed, filling up a lot of time around that. So whilst because obviously properties take time to complete. So even though they were agreed in quite quick succession, it took time to complete over the next sort of 12 months. And then whilst I was waiting for all that to go through, I just allowed the absolute shiny penny to nearly break me, basically. So obviously the way that you explain it, Jackie, is is very simple. Um, and obviously there was a hell of a lot that went into this journey and, you know, this, this success, but just to break it down for people at home, when you say that you was raising finance to buy all these buy to lets, were you buying these buy to let properties in cash, adding value and then refinancing onto a mortgage? Um, no, we were buying, we were buying with investors, with the properties, um, on a mortgage from day one. So we were, yeah. We were we were we we've got, we were a big fan of joint ventures basically. Right. So that was our initial way that we were buying properties, um, basically sharing in sharing in the equity and getting investors on board for that. So whilst we have done some you know done loans along the way, our much more of our primary has been working as equity partnerships where investors are putting in the funds, yeah. we're doing the work and managing everything, and then we're sharing in the in the capital uplift yeah. and the cash flow. It's a great business model. You're bringing the knowledge, the sweat equity sourcing the deals getting them locked in and then basically you've got someone else funding the deals it's just another way of highlighting what's possible right the power of knowledge the power of education and people don't understand this everybody has value in their heads right i'm not it doesn't always have to be property but everybody knows something about something 
And that value in all different areas of life has value, right? And people need to understand that because I know a lot of people personally who are at home, not happy with where they are, you know, didn't go to school or, or dropped out of school like I did, like you did by the sounds of it. And it's like, well, I don't know anything. I don't know anything of value. I can't offer anything to the world. But it's not true. We all have value in our brains that, that, mm. that is of value to somebody else. And if you can bring that together with that person, then that's when big things can happen. Tell me a little bit about how you felt when it came to handling other people's money. What was that responsibility or that weight like for you when you're sitting down with you know, family at the beginning, which we're big advocates for as well. It's always the easiest place to start as long as you can still make sure that you can hold up your end, right? What was it like taking people's money? Was Did that keep you awake at night in the beginning? No, I think like um, both me and um, my husband and business partner, Dave, we're just very good at taking responsibility. Always, and that's, it's actually been, a, it's a good thing and a bad thing taking too much responsibility for other people's stuff has been a bit of a theme. But anyway, that's a different story. So yeah, no, I, I felt, I felt a sense of responsibility and I wanted to do an amazing job for them. Um, and I knew that I could do an amazing job for them. So no, it didn't keep me up at night. Obviously when we encountered challenges, not really in that, probably in that first year, but down the line, that, that was, that's been different when, you know, when stuff hasn't gone how you wanted it to, and you don't want to let the other person down, um, that that has definitely kept kept us up at night um, over the course of the years that have followed. But no, that responsibility is just has always been quite natural to me. Like I just want to do a great job, and I know that I I will do a great job, and I'll do right by that person. So yeah, not in that first phase of, of working with investors. And do, do you mind if I dig just a little bit deeper into that specific part of your journey? Because for a lot of people who are wanting to get into property, and the idea of raising finance seems it's like, you know, it's not even possible, right? It's a fairy tale. It's a pipe dream. It's what I read about and hear about. It never happened to me. If they do believe that it's possible, but they're wondering, well, how the hell does that work? What was the actual steps that you took in real life? Tell us a little bit about how you raised that first, you know, significant amount of money. Was it in a coffee shop, trembling with like the pitch deck or, or was it a comfortable situation with, with a family member in the front room? How did it look? So the first stuff was the comfortable situation with a family member in the front room using the case study of the first deal as an example and saying this is what we could do together. So I kind of feel in a way that one's potentially less valuable. I feel like either you're up for working with family if you're or you're not. But I think the ones where we then went outside the family was just me. In hindsight, I was just making friends, you know, like going and doing a property course and you become you make friends with someone and they've got money and they don't have as much time as you and then keeping in touch and then finding out a way to work together and going back and forwards over emails or maybe having a couple of meetings um, in, a, in a coffee shop in London like that was more of the reality there for those subsequent investors I think what was great about the initial family member stuff was it was like there was complete clarity we're doing single let properties in southeast London here's the first one we think it's a great opportunity to go and do more. We could do it together. They were, they were up for it. What got much harder was when that shiny penny thing started to creep in and we're raising investment without that same clarity. It became a very hard work process to raise finance when we weren't totally clear what we were mm. actually doing. And then it became a much more drawn out process. So really how I approach stuff in that first sort of wave of going out and raising finance, if I was doing it again, I would do it very differently. And for me, that clear focus about what, what is the model that I'm actually doing and just being focused on that when it comes to raising finance, because that's where we started to go wrong. And it just took us a very long time um, with some of the investors that we weren't clear with to, to go through that process and get into deals, which it didn't when we had that initial clarity. I don't know if I've made sense in what I've said there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's, there's, there's books about this stuff, right? To focus on the one thing, right? Keep it simple, become the expert in your chosen field. So that exactly like you said, when you sit down with, him, with an investor who as you grow probably isn't going to always be your mum or your auntie or, you know, Aunt Mabel, whatever, it is, you are going to have to venture out and you are going to be start going out to angel investors and business people and they want and need to hear absolute crystal clear clarity 
on the things that you're selling, right? So that is a really big tip. Don't, don't overcomplicate it. Don't try and set the world on fire in every single strategy. Choose the thing that aligns with you. Again, coming back to maybe sitting down at the beginning and saying, okay, what do I want? Do I want to be more hands-on? Do I want a more passive investment? Do I want to go down the HMO model, for example, and then outsource the management and just sit back and get the nice cash flow that they generate? Or do I want to be more hands-on in a service accommodation business? You know, having a clear idea of what you want at the beginning kind of tells you really what, what aligns with you when you're going down the property road. Um, Jackie, I'm also interested to know, um, you're in business now with your partner, husband. Um, husband, am I right in saying that? Yeah, husband, yeah. Okay, and I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping that, you, that you're going to agree with me, that he's been very supportive throughout your throughout your this kind of entrepreneurial journey. Tell me a little bit about that, how that's worked, because I've said this a few times now, You've got to have your, your partner's got to be aligned with your vision, mostly, right? At the very least, they've got to be incredibly supportive, lift you up when you're having down days, tell you that you can do this, tell you that you're capable, right? And be supportive. How has it been from the beginning working alongside your current partner going through this journey? Has there ever been any times where it's been like, well, oh, you know, maybe we should you know, play it a bit more safe and maybe you should just get a job or any of that kind of stuff? Or was it, has it been completely a unit from day one going on this journey in the same, same, same direction? I think, no, he's always been supportive and is always there to, to bolster me up whenever, yeah, whenever I have a wobble. Um, yeah. And I guess definitely in that, particularly in maybe the first 18 months, two years when he wasn't, it wasn't his baby. He was just supporting me to, 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 to make the baby. Um, he was, yeah, really supportive and did whatever he could. And when it went, was not going well, he just was encouraging me to just keep going and to keep finding a way. And then I guess since he then came on and it's been more of our baby together, the business, it's, yeah, we sometimes, each of us have our bad days and our wobbles and we always support the other person. We talk, we talk it out. And yeah, I guess the business has really taught us how to communicate incredibly well as a couple. Like, I think we are a stronger couple because we have a business um, uh, along the way. So yeah, that support goes, goes both ways. And he's been through some very rough times and so have I, and that's, I'm so grateful he's been there. Because mm, you both get to see the behind the scenes of each other's lives, right? What goes on behind closed doors? You know, like we see on social media these days, it's all rainbows and butterflies and, you know, big success stories and Lamborghinis and private jets. But there's a hell of a lot of shit that goes on in the background that you need to be able to support yourself and your partner through. And, you know, the reason I wanted to touch on that is because I, I do think I'm not saying that, you know, you and your partner need to be going in the exact same direction. You both need to be in business. You both need to be entrepreneurial. I'm not saying that, but I am saying and I do truly believe that if you are with someone who is the absolute tailor opposite and you're trying to you're trying to build this business and you're taking risks and you're raising finance and then you've got this other person who's just like no you know play it safe let's take a you know a one holiday a year and let's not risk anything and let's just pay the mortgage down on the house you know that's when you can start to you know pull in different directions and i think if you are in that situation unfortunately you know i did a post about this the other day you might find yourself in a, in a place where you've you know, you've got, you got to kind of choose, do I want to go after my dreams and mm. big vision and this big wine, this big driver and, you know, become my best self, or do I want to, you know, stay with this person and, and, you know, that's maybe a, a more easier, more easier to face comfortable option. It's a hard place to be. It's a place mm. I've been in. Um, and, but you know, it's great that you're, you know, you're obviously aligned with your partner and going in the same direction, which is huge. Um, so where you are today, what is it that you're doing day to day? Is it just more of the same? Is it is it the you know the JV um, arrangements on the buy to let properties, just on a much bigger scale because that is what you've found just works. Yeah, uh, it's been it's been shifting really. I guess it always shifts, and I guess this is one of the things that is has been interesting to see along the way. Like I guess in my mind, I thought you'd find the way of doing it and then you get it working and then you just keep going with that but that's that's not life like the market changes interest rates change mm. regulation changes like it's never static so for us we were f purely focused on doing blocks of flats um mostly uh, on the coast in kent um and that's what we did 
after refinding our focus again after the old shiny penny syndrome that I spoke about in 2015. Um, we've, we've started doing blocks of flats instead. And um, yeah, for us, since alongside the property investing, we've been building really two other businesses as well. Um, one is where we, we actually mentor other people in property who are going from just buying property and helping them to turn it into a business that can actually serve them. And we've been working with people for you know many years, watching their journey, advising them, guiding them. Um, and once the Liz bus bus, the Liz Trust budget um, 18 months ago, that, things yeah. really shifted. It is a bit of a tongue twister. Best not to be discussed that phase. Yeah. So yeah, obviously that phase was kind of crazy for all of us, right? Like interest rates like suddenly completely shifted. Um, and for us off the back of that, making the deal stack in the way that we were before just hasn't been the same. Much, much tougher to find the deals that work. And maybe you find ones that are work on a capital basis, but actually they don't work on a cash flow on a basis. So it's kind of been a big ch period of shifting and changing. Um, and our, our, big hairy audacious goal with the property company was a hundred homes in a hundred locations across the UK. Um, so that was the big hairy, you know, sort of 30 year plan. And um, it was really interesting that um, in my mind, the old version of myself imagined that it would be get to a hundred properties in that location. And then we go find the next location set all the team up there start buying properties there buy a hundred there go to the next place do that like that's what i thought was gonna how it was gonna play out um but interestingly as this whole shift of the sands has occurred we kind of got to that point for in the current location and we're looking anyway to start to shift that area and then we realized actually that approach that we were planning before in terms of how we were going to expand was really from the old version of us <laughs> and we've been working with all these amazing people for years helping them to craft their businesses and they're in lots of different locations around the uk so we've kind of created this incredible network of experienced investors doing different things in property so that's where our strategy is shifting to it's really a unification of what we've done with our mentoring and business training for others and our investing actually bringing the two aspects of it together so that we can work in partnership with many more people in different locations give our investors access to different models in different locations and to expand in this way to new locations in a way that was completely unexpected um but we're just in the very first phases of um doing some deals out um out in wales um which is a complete new uh shift in focus for us which i never imagined and i'm kind of becoming open to that that actually sometimes these amazing avenues open up in the way things don't unfold how you expect them actually for the best and again it comes back to the fact that you're out there you're doing stuff you're busy you're meeting people doors are opening opportunities are coming along and and this is what this is what happens when you're when you're just out there and you're busy and it, and it's a beautiful thing you know we're also coaching in the serviced accommodation space and you know we haven't been doing it that long but i'm already finding that it's so it's such a rewarding thing to take the knowledge that you've got to take the inspiration that you can give and and help to lift other people up because unfortunately and again what we was talking about your past traumas that you've had things people have said all of these knock-on effects add up to us as adults sitting at home thinking we're not worthy no one cares no one's going to listen no one's inspired by me what you know who am i imposter syndrome da, 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 da. you know all the flashing lights and all the you know all this stuff going off in your mind and to take someone and almost you know shake them not literally but to say look you are worthy you can do this you know people do want to listen to your stories people are inspired by you and when you can push them over that very difficult ledge right and they start putting themselves out there and documenting their journey and telling the world what they do i had a mentee the other day messaged me and she she said alex my you know because i was pushing her into social media and pushing her to do her lives and pushing her to tell people everything what she's doing she messaged she said alex i don't know what to do my inbox is blowing up I've got family members, <laughs> I've got friends messaging me saying they want a coffee meets, they want to sit down, they want to buy some tips and this and that. And I was like, this is what happens. This is what happens when you start believing that you're capable, right? So it's really, really cool. So I want to move a little bit more. It's you, at properties. It's like, you know, you've done so much. It's amazing. And, I, and I'd implore anyone to go and, you know, look into your story and look into your bio. We'll put it all in the studio notes of the numbers that you've generated and the investment that you've raised and the deals that you've done, you know, it's very, very inspiring. And, you know, I, I hope to be where you are as well at some point uh, in the very, very near future. 
tell me a little bit about your love for travel, Jackie, because this is what lights me up. I spend many, many months a year over in Mallorca, um, cycling my bike in the mountains, which is why I, I kind of, you know, I'm radiating here in front of this orange sign at the minute. Um, but tell me about your, because this was a big reason for your why, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm not um, mistaken, right? This six week, what is it? A holiday every six weeks? Is that this thing that you holiday every six weeks? Yeah. Well, that wasn't where it started. Obviously, you asked me like when we started, did we have a clear vision? And really, no. It was just like I want to go on lots of holidays, and I don't want to have to ask. And um, that you know, I wanted to be able to go skiing for more than one week in the year. Um, and actually it was a business coach that sat down with us and made us go, you need to be clearer on what a vision actually is for you. Like lots of holidays is not a vision. What does that actually mean? And that's what forced us to go, okay, let's put something more specific around this. We could go on holiday every six weeks. That would be like a life beyond our wildest dreams. That was in 2015 that we set that down. That's what we wanted. Um, and yeah, it's really kind of, it's totally escalated over the last few years the whole travel thing um but yeah before before covid we would just have this wonderful rhythm of we just pick a different place to go on holiday for every six weeks and um yeah whether that was like going camping in europe or flying down south africa or backpacking in asia like it we just that that was it like that was the whole reason for property it was like i i don't want to have to ask for permission and i want to go on loads of of travel and that we got the property business to that point that it enabled us to do that. And then it's obviously gone absolutely mental since COVID and it's gone to a whole other level, basically. Yeah, it, it, it shouldn't be, you know, it, it, a huge passion of mine and something I talk about all the time is we've got this one life, right? This finite life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it's over, it's over. It's the one thing like we all know that we can't buy back. And when it's gone, it's gone. And, you know, I'm 42 now. I'm not old. I'm not young. I can definitely feel you know, certain things slowing down. I have to go to bed a little bit earlier. I can't have more than one beer of an evening, you know, so all this stuff starting to catch up with me, right? And I recognize that and I embrace that. But what it does help me to realize is I've, I need to live now. Like I'm not willing to wait. I'm not willing to wait until I'm 65. If I get there, right? The chances are I get there. Who knows? We could be dead tomorrow. It's, it's morbid, but it's true, right? You never know what's around the corner. Unfortunately, we all know friends, family members, people that we're close to that, you know, are, you know, dealing with awful diseases and horrible things that are happening to them. So we've got to live life now. We cannot wait. So I'm all about creating a life where we can enjoy our best years now, right? While we're young enough to enjoy them physically and mentally, because even if we do get to retirement age, which isn't guaranteed that everybody's just banking on will happen. The chances are, unfortunately, mm -hmm. you're going to have, you know, some ailments, right? Could be high blood pressure, could be high cholesterol, could be, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, could be a bad hip, whatever it is. The chances are you're not going to be able to enjoy your skiing like you can do now, today, mm -hmm. whatever, you, whatever age you are. So this whole idea of waiting and treating a two week holiday as this big reward and it's been amazing and I felt alive and I wake up with you know, life in my eyes and I feel fit and the sun on my skin makes me feel amazing, but it's all got to come to an end because I've got to go back to this life that I don't enjoy, you know, and prepare for the next time in 12 months that I can go and feel that feeling again. That to me is completely upside down and inside out and back to front. We should be working hard for two or three days a week and spending the rest of the time enjoying life. So hell yes, definitely. I last totally, like I'm not, we're totally about, being really efficient, being really focused with what we do, being really efficient with how we do it. And then, yeah, as you say, like having, like, you know, we're, we're in Cape Town right now. We're here for seven weeks. We're not on holiday for all of the seven weeks. We are doing what you just said there. Like we're working for three days out of the week and then we're having holidays every weekend. Yeah. And then we also still have the holiday every six weeks where we don't have any meetings or we don't work hard for three days in the middle of it. But yeah, like this is, this is for me what it's all about. And I actually think it's incredibly good for the business as well, because we are exposed to all these different cultures and people and ways of doing things like our businesses are stronger because we do it. And we are, yeah, I'm getting to live my best years with my husband, seeing the world and it, but keeping ourselves interested. I often actually see people who are just traveling and not, not, you know, doing anything really in terms of work. And they get a bit bored. I actually feel like it's the best of all worlds, really, to have 
something that you're like can put your energy and your mind into and yeah. work on and and see those results and then to just let go and have fun yeah because then you get the reward at the end of it right if you're not doing anything then it all becomes a little bit meaningless but if you're working hard you have mm. a big win and then you're like great now i'm going to go on that trip and take that boat ride to that exotic island and you know it's like a celebration at the end of all the hard work but you know i i put out a post about this a little while ago and you know about how we've got to live our best life now and you know the clock's ticking and the sand's running right the egg timer kind of theory and it was kind of a real mixed response it, it went a little bit viral and loads of people were jumping all over me saying oh you know this is it and life's life and da 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 and it's all right for you to say that but how's it possible mm -hmm. and and i was having to reply and say look it's, i'm not saying it's easy but if you, as long as you, if you start now right with an end goal in mind and you start working the key is to create something that doesn't need you physically to be there in order to get paid right that is the golden mm -hmm. ticket to get out the job mm -hmm. start building a business that over time you can start to systemize and implement processes and, and, and automation, right? Teams, which I'm sure you've got a big team of people working for you. And you can start to take a back seat and start reaping the rewards of all of the hard work that you've put in at the front end. So that's what I was getting at. And that is in the reach of everybody. And it doesn't have to be a multi-million pound business. You don't have to be, you know, trying to achieve all this materialistic stuff. You just want your time that's all i want time totally freedom. yeah and i think it's interesting like that was all we wanted like it wasn't really for me about it wasn't about having loads of money i just wanted the time and enough money to be able to go out and experience stuff it didn't have to be this luxury life that i was living but it's actually funny and i also didn't want to work you know i was like i want to have enough money coming in that i don't have to work but i think the funny thing is you get to that point Actually, you do. You do want to work. Want you to want to work at something meaningful. You just want the choice exactly. to work and the choice to choose what you do. And actually, I think we talk ourselves out of like, oh, like, oh, I don't need enough. I don't need much money. Like we kind of we we limit ourselves. It's true. We don't need it. But actually, if we're doing something that's adding great service to people, if we're having one hell of a time doing it, if we're doing it in a way that lifts everyone up, like, yeah, why not go out there and make a ton of money whilst you're doing it at the same time? Because really that's that showing the the value that you are creating in the world. And if you tell yourself you don't need much money to do it, you don't focus on delivering the highest value of service and serving the most people. So for me, that's like the journey that I definitely have gotten onto. It's like, it's no, I don't need loads of money, but I can go out and create loads of value and create loads of money. And what what can you do in the world? Like if you can create millions or billions of pounds what you know you can look at problems that you don't think are right in the world and you can do things about it but you know doing all of that from a place of i don't need it i'm doing it because i'm enjoying what i'm doing it and i'm putting out good energy into the world and i'm helping others and it's funny i would never have when i started i would never have been able to say those things or see those things but having been through the journey to having everything that we said that we wanted and thinking I was just going to be able to kick back and, you know, drink a martini every day or whatever. That's not it. Actually, you get there and you want to keep learning and growing and you want to enjoy what you're doing. And there's always going to be stuff that you want to do. And if you're doing it well, you are going to make a ton of money whilst you're at it. And hey, what great stuff could you do in the world if you can do that? It's a natural byproduct, Jackie, isn't it? Because when you're in a place where you want to be, not where you need to be, and you're doing something that you love and enjoy, the natural byproduct of that is well, I feel great. I'm happy. I've got to this place in life where I, that I could never have dreamed of. It feels good, right, to wake up and be able to choose what I want to do with my time. So naturally, you want to inspire others to do that. And you don't even need to try. You just tell your story mm -hmm. and it naturally inspires other people. So it's just a knock on effect. People are like, well, shit, I want to be where Jack is at. And it's like, you know, it just starts happening because you've made the steps to get to where you are today. So it's really powerful. And where you are as well, it's just, it's, it's all about getting to a place of choice. Like you said, that was a really big thing that jumped out. When you're choosing, I want to be in South Africa this week and I'm going to go and climb Table Mountain and I'm going to come back and crunch some new deals, right? You're going to sit there and you're going to crunch those deals a hell of a lot more efficiently than you are if you're sitting in your dark, you know, office, wherever, you know, without beating down on the UK. But, you know, brought a chance that it's going to be dark and gloomy, so... It's yeah. true, but I also think it's like, you're totally right. Like I think we, we didn't intend for this with all the travel, but it has been a byproduct of it. It's disconnected us from the UK 
in a really good way and it's made me see how like particularly the, the newspapers and the culture of that kind of yeah of the press in the uk yeah, and the negative too. environment that creates it is actually suffocating yeah. and actually we have the choice when we're in the uk to completely disconnect from it but it's, it's much day. harder to do so and actually hadn't realized how much of a negative impact that was having and us having spent a lot of time out of the uk now like we don't i'm not sucked into the negativity of, of it anymore um and even when we're there i'm much more able to keep distance from the the cultural narrative around how hard things is how we need to pull that person down how crap so and so is doing it this thing or whatever and actually what that's done from a mindset perspective is more liberation like more more choice more ability to do to be on my own path and not be sucked into that and it's amazing how much more good can happen when you unplug from all of that rubbish absolutely it's just a control thing really isn't it that you start to learn as you mm. kind of pull away from it Jackie, I'm aware of the time, so I know that you're an incredibly busy person. You've got a lot of stuff on your schedule today. Why don't you? Um, why don't we start talking a little bit, just briefly, about your book? I know that you've got a book coming out. Why don't you tell us about that and how it can serve other people and help them move forward in their lives? Oh, this is so exciting. This is the first time I've really spoken about it. So it's, um, yeah, super exciting to be doing that here with you, Alex. Uh, it is called Finding the Freedom Formula, uh, and it is the journey of the last 10 years of going and creating time and financial and location freedom from property and the highs and the lows along the way of making that all happen. Um, and us realizing once we got to the point of having everything that we wanted in property, that there's actually something that we'd completely missed and neglected that we could have focused on so much sooner to be able to make the whole process more enjoyable. Um, so yeah, filled of the, it's a, it's a great, it's a great story, but it's also got a lot of, uh, systems and processes in there that you can use to leverage the mistakes that we've made along the way as well. Sounds to me like it needs to be another one of those crinkled up books that's on every property investor's bookshelf. Uh, Hopefully we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> needs to be up there with rich dad, poor dad. Listen, Jackie, um, we could sit here and talk for days, weeks, months about, like I said, your wins, you know, your success, the, the numbers, you know, and I, I would just say we, we don't have time because you've got so much on your schedule. Go and check out Jackie. Go and see what she's achieved. Go and go and see what's possible. Um, you know, if you just say, you know, I want more and I'm going to go out and I'm going to make it happen. Just before, just before we do wrap things up, you said way back, I don't know, about 40 minutes ago or so when we spoke about that, those first investors that you raised finance with. And you said, oh, you know, it just kind of happened. You know, it was a kind of an offshoot of just kind of going out for lunches and doing network and all the rest of it. I would reflect back. I would reflect that back to you and say that, you know, because I noticed this on these podcasts with successful people. Oh, yeah, it just happened. Oh, I just bumped into this person. It didn't just happen. It was a consequence of all of the hard work that you was doing. No doubt a lot of those networking meetings, a lot of those stand up and pitches, a lot of those sitting down with investors was very, very uncomfortable moments for you. And, you know, the fact that you did that and pushed through it and educate yourself to get to that point and raise that money is just a testament to you and the entrepreneurial traits that obviously you demonstrate, which is now where you are today. So I just wanted to reflect that back and say it didn't just happen. And everybody needs to realize that you've got to turn off Netflix Put down the Dorito chips and and get out and tear shit up, you know, if you want to be living the kind of life that Jack is living today. So well done. Um, lastly, if I can ask you just for a minute to be a little bit vulnerable, a little bit honest, a little bit open with me and everybody who's watching and listening to this at home. Mental health. I'm a big advocate for it. I've had my anxieties, my depressions, my traumas, relationship breakdowns, you know, God, the end of the world, you know, I've been in some very dark places. Um, I think it's easy to look at people like you and other people that are on the show uh, and say, well, you know, they've got it all going for them, lucky them, you know, they don't have the problems I've got. Would you say, Jackie, um, where you are today, this very minute in life, um, mentally, you, you're you're happy every day with where you are, or are you still kind of experiencing, you know, the kind of mental challenges that go along with entrepreneurialism and life? Yeah, always, always experiencing the, the challenges. And I think as long as you're continuing to, to grow and push yourself, they're going to just keep coming up, right? Like that's, we've all collated all of these traumas from not just our life, but our genetic history as well. Yeah, so every, every day I, I sit and I meditate every morning 
and I will look to the uncomfortable stuff that's going on inside that my mind is trying to tell me that I'm not good enough or I shouldn't be doing that or whatever it may be. And I have a little cry most days, like letting go of whatever that is, because yeah, we're, we're all just trying to be okay. And that, what, that level of what you have to go through to be okay is just, it's just different as you evolve and step up. And I would say the, the main difference now is that I'm aware of it I know it's not me and I could just sit and remind myself every day when I don't feel good or something is making me not feel good enough or worthy enough it that that's not that's not who I am and to be able to sit back and disconnect from that feeling and notice that and have the ability to let go of it so that I can keep moving forwards but yeah definitely some days I am definitely not okay and I guess the other difference is i much kinder to myself now than I used to be before I would like beat myself up if I was having a bad day and push through and now I go you know what I'm not having a good day I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna close the laptop I'm I'm gonna go for a walk I'm gonna lie down I'm gonna watch I'm gonna binge watch something on Netflix which you know what that's what I need today is to not push through um, and that kindness just gives me more and more energy and the ability to to hold and manage much more yeah fantastic always always put yourself first I do the same thing when I feel it all building. I've got all this stuff going on. I'm like, you know what? I know I've got a deadline for that, a deadline for this. But right now, you know, close the laptop, take the dog out, take a bath, whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat that kind of shifts you into that happier place. So appreciate your uh, your honesty there. Uh, just kind of highlighting to people at home that, you know, everybody's got their struggles. Everybody's, you know, working through stuff, but highlights the fact that you're proactive with it you're meditating, you're no doubt journaling, you're doing all of these steps that ultra successful people do instead of just sitting at home and crying and going, my life shit. You're like, no, park that, do this, right? It's all about just kind of getting it, getting it done. So Jackie, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I'm glad we spoke about your book. We tried to cover as much property stuff as we could. I know it would be a challenge because you've got so much stuff going on. There's loads of other stuff. Like I said, go and check Jackie out. She'll blow your mind. We're going to put all of your information in the show notes, Jackie, all about your book, how people can contact you, reach out to you, talk about possible mentoring, talk about, you know, breaking down those, those mindset uh, shifts about, you know, being, being capable and all that kind of good stuff that you bring to the world. So reach out to Jackie. She's an amazing person. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast and anything you want to add, Jackie, have I missed anything or have we, we pretty much covered? No, fantastic. Really great conversation. And you're right. There's so many angles that we can go down. I think you've covered a really wonderful um, breadth of this. So it's um, yeah. Amazing questioning. And I'm excited to see who else you get interviewing. Cause uh, yeah, you're awesome. So well done, Alex. Onward and upward. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thanks everybody for watching and listening at home. And we'll see you again on the next episode of the Airbnb Nomads. Until then, take care. Jackie, thanks again. That was amazing. Thank you.